Hi, everybody. So you think you are here for a talk on game design and education. And uh, actually, you're here to see whether or not I survived this talk. Uh, allow me to explain. Uh, my name is Jason Weiser. For the last five years, I've been teaching a crazy pants course uh, at Tufts University and Harvard University's extension school called Game Design, uh, which is actually tabletop game design, uh, alternate reality game design, gameplay testing, intro to Unity Game Engine and C Sharp programming, intro to 3D art and animation, introduction to 2D art and animation, introduction to audio for games, paper prototyping, level design, including rational game design and encounter building, VR tools and considerations, team building communication, digital game prototyping, pipeline development, models of team management, marketing, industry networking, and more. Uh, so this past fall, I described this course to Ian Schreiber. Is anybody familiar? Uh, he uh, is one of the lead teachers at Rochester Institute of Technology. Uh, he is on the board of the Global Game Jam. He runs the, uh, the Game Education Summit at Game Developers Conference. Uh, he is a remarkable individual, phenomenal teacher. He is someone who should be listened to. And he heard me describe this course, and he said, uh, with some expletives taken out, this course of yours breaks all the rules I know of for game education. I always tell people to learn one thing at a time, otherwise you're going to end up frustrated with a doomed project, and yet you just mash it all together and go. In my head, I can't imagine how this can possibly work. Do you ever get any decent quality games out of this class, or is it 100% train wrecks and learning by failure? Which is essentially to say, who would ever want to take this court, uh, this circus, and who would ever want to teach it? And I respond to that, actually, uh, all the projects succeed as engaging and playable prototypes, Many are amazingly original concepts, and some have gone on to be published on the Steam and App Stores. And then uh, this week, as in this week, 48 hours ago, uh, he asked me to deliver a GDC talk one month from now, uh, where I actually finally explained to him how this works and 300 other people. Uh, and then I asked Caroline yesterday if she had any open slots so I could practice it. <laughs> understand it wasn't written when I asked her that. Uh, she said yes. Um, someone had just dropped out. Someone else was doing a game education talk during the slot, during the non-learning day. Uh, so I stayed up all night getting my notes together, and here we are. So uh, if I trip, uh, stumble, or generally start mumbling, I lose a point. If it happens three times, the talk fails. Yes? If I actually collapse, because I have not slept for a day now, um, uh, or you know, have a heart attack, anything like that, it also fails. And then please call somebody. <laughs> so uh, a little bit of background about me. Uh, I'm an artist, an animator, a game designer, and an educator. I was a senior artist at Firehose Games for a few years, where we made Slam Bolt Scrappers. Uh, and I was the lead animator on the pre-development team for Harmonix's Dance Central, and I do a lot of uh, various character design, and environment design, and animation for various companies. Uh, I've worked uh, with uh, some amazing people on a project for the Metropolitan Museum of Art a couple summers ago. Uh, a. Thomas Goldberg of EA fame was uh, lead on that. We used the Unreal Engine and a $70,000 uh, mocap rig and live actors to generate the performance of a statue that had shattered 12 years earlier in the curators of the museum. is a 500-year-old single piece of Carrera marble that they had painstakingly put together, often with 3D modeling. And a major uh, uh, theater director, Reed Farrington, was called on to create this interactive experience. And because they weren't willing to spend the additional 15000 on the face rig, I got to do all the facial animation including things I'd never happened to animate before, like Adam falling in love with Eve and chewing an apple, because this is uh, Tullio Lombardo's Adam. And that ran for a summer at the Met. Uh, I have, uh, for a couple of years, not recently, but some time ago, I was animating robots at MIT's um, personal robotics group. And I was the season two animator on the Disney ABC family show Greek. I should go through these faster. Uh, I, was a, I uh, had been a comic book artist for the Boston Globe. Uh, specifically, this was 
uh, helping children with severe disabilities at Franciscan Children's Hospital envision themselves as superheroes. We ran these for a few months, and they were great fun to do. Uh, I am a regular artist at Choice of Games, where it's all text adventures, and I do the cover arts. And I run a children's game company. Um, we did a iPad game called Dino Trucks uh, before I knew that there existed also a television show. Uh, and I uh, better known for a card game, a cooperative family card game called Monsters in the Elevator, which has won some nice awards. Uh, the kids' company is with my daughter. She's nine. I'm really glad this is being recorded. She wanted me to make sure that happened. Uh, and while I've been doing this for the last 15 years, I've also been uh, teaching for about 24 years. Uh, three years as a high school English teacher and humanities teacher in a city, Baltimore, through Teach for America, uh, which I'll be talking more about shortly. Uh, 19 years of teaching college art, animation, and game design. Uh, and I also do uh, workshop lecturing. Uh, so I taught for a summer at Pixar. Uh, I taught the layout team how to model and texture and animate because they were kind of sick of sending backgrounds to the background team just so they could fit the camera where they needed to go. Uh, they were all NYU cinematography students who had no idea how to do 3D. I'm currently at Tufts and Harvard, but I've taught at Emerson, at Northeastern, at Leslie. Uh, I was at the New England Institute of Art for 12 years, the last two of which was as the uh, head of the animation department. Uh, specifically, I want to talk, though, about Teach for America. I was there from 1995 to 1998, before there was much of a thing called the web. And so inner city kids, in that case, were not really experiencing much out of their purview. Um, and were really starving to learn about the world. It was my first time encountering students who were just hungry for anything I could give them. Uh, so I turned my English courses into a survey of everything I could get my hands on. So we read Octavia Butler's science fiction right next to Shakespeare's sonnets. I taught them how to waltz. I taught them Israeli folk dancing. Um, and I learned the uh, value of teaching to multiple learning styles uh, and as well as uh, the value of project-oriented uh, lessons where everything that I give them for homework there's nothing that's rote, there's nothing that's prescribed, there are certain elements I'm asking them to try to attempt, but otherwise it's their story, it's their project, it's what gets them excited so that their interests drive the direction, but also the complexity of their, correction, of their uh, creations. If anybody here is a teacher, a great way to make sure that your students can never complain about giving them too much homework is get them to design the homework, and those who don't want to design much won't, and those who will will work their butts off and maybe like this, not sleep, and have a danger of dying. <laughs> uh, but then when I came to this side of the country and started teaching at sometimes four or five schools at the same time, uh, I started to realize uh, how different even college students are from each other. I knew that teaching inner city Baltimore and teaching in San Francisco were going to be different experiences. Uh, but to find out how completely different the populations of students were at Emerson College versus Northeastern versus Leslie, uh, Harvard and Tufts, uh, different in terms of how the school was formatting the classes. At NEIA, we had 18 courses to teach animation. Um, at Northeastern, we had four. At uh, Emerson, we had two. And so I had to think about what we're keeping and what we're cutting. But also the students, some of these populations had day jobs or families and some didn't and some had uh, different interests. At Northeastern, it's a five-year school and I found out that they were completely different populations just second year to fourth year and I had to change my learning style for that. Uh, now, when I have designed curriculum for games that is not the crazy class that I'm talking about today, uh, I do something that's much more of a traditional model. Uh, somewhere around five to six courses, uh, we get a tabletop game design class to learn mechanics and how to organize humans into playful experiences. We get a course in level design that is often an introduction to a game engine like Unity or Unreal, a game environment art course that will often expand understanding level design, uh, a course in programming that often is also an introduction to prototyping course where we start making small games, and then uh, one or two semesters of a capstone, which is also usually team production. Has anybody participated in a program like that? Raise hands. Bunch of you. Out of curiosity, anybody here from Champlain? Champlain tried to mirror theirs after, after a CMU. Has anybody here seen Randy Pasha's last lecture? 
two of you, three of you, oh, everybody should go watch that. Uh, in addition to an amazing experience, he talks about game design education as semester one, make a game, semester two, make a game, semester three, make a game, as like these big team production things. And he's mostly talking about a graduate program. Uh, but I love that, and certainly uh, I think most game design programs uh, look toward that now. And as Ian mentioned in his feedback earlier, each topic is taught on its own with a chance to develop skills in that one area and a reasonable measured difficulty curve through major topics in game design and development. So 2014, I'm realizing that the New England Institute of Art is going to be uh, no more in, in just a few years. I'm looking at other options. I have an acquaintance at Tufts. I don't expect to get in there, especially in the CS department. I'm not a computer scientist, despite what my ID there says. Uh, so I just ask, what are you folks doing in games? I get a response about 10 minutes later that says, pitch us something. And he goes on to say that uh, the curriculum for the spring will be locked in two weeks. So you need to do this now. So I say, I can teach game design. He says, great, it needs to include programming. Going back a little bit, programming is number four, right? And if they haven't had number one, two, or three, what are we doing? So I guess I say, okay, so I can teach all of games. <laughs> and I figured if I'm teaching the first four, you might as well get to number five as well, and let's get some team production in here. So in three days, I sent a completely insane syllabus outline that combined much of the material of five semesters of traditional game design education. And in my interview with the head of the computer science department, uh, Soha Hasun, who was just amazingly kind to me, I promised this course would teach their computer science students how to think and plan before they code. That was my pitch to the computer science department. And miraculously, they said yes. I still don't know why they said yes. <laughs> I know that the Tufts Computer Science Department is known for their focus on theory and generally avoids practicums like mine. In fact, I teach one of the only two courses uh, on the books in their department. The other one is about uh, learning how to create good security systems. Uh, and that's it, everything else is theory. And they're actually, I was told, without naming names, uh, they didn't tell me the names, that there were people in the faculty, the full-time faculty, people who get to decide these things, who actually did not want my class in their department. On the other hand, their department had been growing uh, at crazy speeds for so many years that they needed courses. They especially needed electives. And some among the faculty were really excited that this course would be interdisciplinary. And that's become something more important since, uh, which is part of why probably they keep having me run the class. And they agreed to the course a couple of days before the deadline, so it's also possible that uh, Soha actually sort of slipped it in under the radar and just got it on the books. Uh, but it was made very clear to me that uh, if this class wasn't a raving success, it would not be repeated. Uh, this crazy class had to work the very first time. They gave me a beautiful, uh, flexible room with big tables uh, that we could gather around uh, in teams. I got 36 students the first semester, which is a very small class in the computer science department where often classes are closer to 100 or 200 students per class. Uh, I have not taught that big yet because they don't have a room that can do it. I need a room where you can sit around tables. I can't do this uh, comfortably. Um, and uh, they gave me this amazing grad TA student, Mike Shaw. Oh, I should include a picture of us in our, in our helmets. Uh, yeah. Uh, he's now teaching at Northeastern. Um, brilliant, amazing computer scientist. Uh, who's also a uh, very thoughtful and deliberate person, and he knew the culture there. Uh, so I'm trying to design the progress of lectures and assignments. How am I going to deliver this galaxy of content in a single semester? Uh, I, I create a plan, and I show it to him to ask if this pacing sounds even remotely reasonable for the culture he's a part of, because I know the culture is different at each school. You need to give something different. If you do it wrong, the students rebel. And I have no idea why he said yes. The course is completely crazy, but he did, and we went forward with it. So now I'd like to explain the courses that currently exists, which has certainly been tweaked over the last five years, and the 10 times I've taught it since at Tufts and at Harvard, uh, but it is fundamentally the course I delivered in 2015. Uh, you don't need to necessarily be able to read all of that, but you're welcome to. I'm going to 
explain generally. This is the first half of the semester. Uh, we start by covering tabletop game design in the first six weeks. The students form teams around two-week projects and then switch into new teams for the next two weeks. We cover how to distinguish between mechanics and story, how to use playtesting and radical revision, uh, how to think in terms of disruption. Uh, are you familiar with the concept of disruption? Who would like to have disruption explained? Okay, so the basic idea of disruption is you have something that is familiar and you therefore have good access for the people who want to jump into this. So you're playing, making another platform, you're making another first person shooter, but then you change something about it, something critical, something in the mechanics that then can percolate throughout to create a different experience. So if I were to say a first person shooter, what would be a disruption of a first person shooter? Uh, you don't get guns, you're only allowed to use feathers. Love it. And in fact, the assignment I give my students after giving some uh, get in, uh, examples from the industry is now everybody in your groups design a first person shooter that is non violent. Uh, we talk about like a first person hoser where you're spraying with a go for that. But uh, actual examples from the industry as well, that was great. What's a, an example of a first person shooter that uses the idea of that perspective, that uses the idea perhaps of using cover? Yes? Um, uh, Portal? Portal's a great example of a disruption of a first person shooter. Yes, you're not killing anybody, uh, you are in fact play with momentum as you go through these holes. Uh, Bioshock would be a, a decent disruption of the first person shooter, especially when you get to shoot bees. <laughs> uh, so we, uh, radical revision, uh, are you familiar with this concept? It's where you take your game, the one you've been working on for quite some time now, you choose one thing that you think is great and you ditch the rest. And then you build the game off that one thing. I don't actually have my students in a single semester do that. I have them perform a thought experiment. Spend an hour with your team, choose one mechanic, design a brand new game around that. You don't actually have to submit that next week. This is during the tabletop parts. Uh, you could, uh, but at least that's going to help you to push the get boundaries of your game concept. Um, so that's, yes. Uh, and playtesting. Uh, how we use playtesting to get feedback, to look for when people are really excited about our game instead of just thinking like, okay, that's fine. To really understand what the excitement looks like when somebody is super jazzed about your game. Uh, and then we have a whole bunch of prompts that are meant to push them into thinking about games in ways that they may perhaps have not uh, in most of their lives. So we look at uh, niche games that might be about making a game for your grandparents down in Florida, uh, or a game for you to play with your cats, or uh, to play with kids who have cancer. Uh, we look at games that talk about workplace routines, uh, things like Papers, Please, uh, or Twin Peak Hospital, where you're messing with those routines to create the mechanics of your game. Just different ways to inspire ideas. We have one week where we make args. Uh, Jane McGonigal is one of the readings that we do, Reality is Broken, and we make alternative reality games as well. And during this first six weeks, these are three hour lessons, I'm able to slip in an hour here or there to get them started on the digital tools. Uh, so we have a couple of lessons on Unity. One on 3D game development, where we work with terrain, we work with fundamentals of lighting, I start introducing them to see sharp code. This is a computer science class. They know how to use C sharp code, but it's bizarre to see how it's used in Unity. The idea that it's not just one big block but you're putting little snippets and everything, just to get comfortable with how it's functioning there. At Tufts, I don't necessarily have that many computers, I'm sorry, at Harvard, I don't necessarily have that many computer science students. Uh, and so there I'm actually doing a bit more teaching of the fundamentals. Uh, but at Tufts, it's mostly just how do you make it work here? Uh, we make cubes spin, we make the cubes respond when you bump into them and beep when you hit them. And give you points as we begin to do scoring. That's the first week uh, in about an hour, hour and 15 minutes when we're covering uh, Unity. And then next week we do 2D game design. We make a basic platformer and get comfortable with the 2D physics. So these are very quick lessons. I have big text and image tutorials. They can follow at my pace. They can go slower or faster. They can finish them at home, but they get enough to be able to get dangerous. And in the second team, they make a tabletop game with their team for homework for the first week. They do an ARG in class the second week, and then they go home and they just do a tutorial in Unity, a tutorial cycle like Rollerball, so they get a bit more comfortable with it there. And then week five, they do their workplace games with their team, 
and week six is their first time, for most of them, making an original game in Unity, and they only have one week to do it. They are making the tabletop game from the previous week with an, an explicit and stated bar of zero success. <laughs> they are told it doesn't matter if it works or not, but the ones who get it working will get it working. <laughs> uh, it doesn't matter if it looks pretty or not, but if yours looks pretty, we will hail you as awesome. Uh, and this is enough. They are excited. Uh, they are uh, typically working pretty hard to get that done. And it's also the first week that they do peer review, which I'll be talking about in just a little bit. Uh, but I, the explicit point of that week, which was not part of the original design, but was suggested by the students, they were saying, we really want before the final project to have the chance to make a lot of mistakes, not just following a set of tutorials, but to try to make something of our own. So this is what that week is about. Make as many mistakes as you possibly can. Make all the mistakes. Just don't break your computers. Uh, and then we get to week seven. Uh, week seven is tremendously fun. Week seven is inspired by the way Rick Eberhardt runs from the MIT uh, Game Lab, how he runs the Global Game Jam here. It's pretty much directly ripped off from him. Uh, the students all uh, pitch games. They've had an hour, sometimes half an hour to an hour to walk around and brainstorm with each other in class. They all have white note cards. They all have colorful stickies that are designed for whatever, that are colored for whatever principal uh, production input they want to have for the rest of the semester. So if they want to be a programmer, they have one color. If they want to be an artist, if they want to be audio, if they want to be working a lot in project management, and they can make strips of these to put them together. But the idea is everybody's doing design. Let's get a sense of what's, what are your main focus going to be? Then they each get one minute to pitch their designs. Not everybody pitches, but they're all invited to and all encouraged to. Usually out of a class of between 30 and 40 students, uh, we get about 25 pitches. There's only like eight slots because we're going to have teams of four to five people, sometimes three, but we try to have no less than four. Uh, and then they vote with their sticker. For anybody who's been here, you've seen this process. And then we spend some time looking at the colors and rebalancing a little bit. Oh, you've got five programmers and nobody wants to do audio or art. You can do that, but let's, let's put somebody over here. Let's give you maybe a programmer over here. Are you willing to move? Uh, I think it was not this past fall or spring, but the previous fall, where I tried to readjust and the students rebelled. They were so excited to be in their completely unbalanced groups. I had one team that had seven students. I've never allowed that, but they really wanted it. And it was not completely catastrophic, <laughs> but they're adults, they're college students. Okay, this is what you want. There's another team that had three people. They weren't terribly happy about it, but they were willing to go for it and their game was delightful. Uh, so people vote with their feet. By the end of an hour and a half process, we have our teams, and they are beginning to work on two weeks of paper prototyping where they are planning it out. They come up with uh, one or two mechanics that they want to demonstrate as a paper prototype. I had one group create a game where you are the immune system of a heavily diseased emperor penguin. <laughs> and they wanted to uh, play with the idea of randomness, and so they created Pachinko, you're familiar? The Coney Island game where you put coins in, they go da, 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 on the little pegs and it goes to the bottom. Except the bottom was different buckets of organs. And so you were trying to put your, uh, the, I think it was the viruses that were going down, but before you did that, you would put your immune things into which organs you were hoping they'd go to. So we decided, actually it wasn't too much fun to have very little control about where that's gonna go and they changed their design based on it. They decided not to do a randomness system. So that was very helpful. Um, we play with, uh, with character creators and we'll stick things together. We sometimes will have uh, an RPG system, although narrative design is explicitly not a part of this introductory course. That's the one thing that I draw the line at. They can do it, but I'm not going to teach it. Uh, that's the advanced class that I'm pitching for next spring. Um, but they will, if they're going to do that, then one of them, of course, plays the game and somebody else comes in and they might deliver cards and having spent six weeks on tabletop games, they suddenly go, oh, that's why we were learning this. So we can understand how to think this way. And I nod and I say, sure, when in fact I consider tabletop games a means to their end, uh, a means unto themselves. And 
they are themselves fantastic, and many of them realize that. Uh, many of them have never played uh, modern board games before this course. Uh, and I don't know if any of you, a couple of you are connected to me on Facebook, so you've seen that massive uh, jump on in pig pile when I asked Facebook, uh, what board game should I get for Tufts? Because they're giving me a budget. And I got 130 answers. Um, and they're delightful. And there are some games I hadn't heard of, which I'm embarrassed about. And they say these are seminal games. I haven't died yet. And we're almost halfway through. How are you doing? Are you finding this interesting? Yes. I'm going to have to give this entire talk in half an hour in one month. <laughs> it will be cut down and will have less tangents and less uh, sleepiness. So they get two weeks on paper prototyping, uh, research, pipeline development, getting all their ducks in a row. And then they uh, have one week, just like they did for their uh, workplace game, where they had one week to get the whole game in. They have one week to try to get the whole game in. Again, with zero expectation of success. You're told, they're told just get as much as you can, let's see what you can accomplish. And then they have two weeks after that to get the full prototype fully working and functioning before we invite guests to come play their game and give them feedback. And the guests are often industry professionals, which they find very intimidating. Ha ha. I don't know how many of you feel intimidating, um, but they would be very intimidated by you. Uh, we, of course, play test every week, the entire semester long. After the three weeks of prototyping, they're then uh, usually in the fall, it's Thanksgiving, and during this time of the year, uh, there's uh, often a break, uh, but it becomes a really good time for them to reconsider their life choices. Uh, sometimes they actually do some sort of radical revision. We've had some of those. Uh, and the last three weeks are this race to fill in all of the gaps, to build out levels, to add more art and audio, uh, sometimes to significantly change the mechanics or add new mechanics. Or especially after uh, a couple of weeks of level design to manage the tutorializing. Is anybody here familiar with the concept of rational game design? <laughs> Ubisoft's secret sauce. Ubisoft wanted to fix difficulty curves so they weren't spending millions of dollars. This is the talk that I gave actually Pete uh, here last year. So they weren't spending millions of dollars on games that people didn't like because they were either were too easy or too hard. Uh, they either got bored or rage quit and they thought this was dumb. So they put together a team, uh, spent a lot of money, 10 years, everybody was sworn to secrecy on pain of their firstborns being thrown into the ocean. And they would uh, send this team all around the world to the different groups uh, under Ubisoft's umbrella to teach in this system. And some designers said, screw you, I know how to design, I don't want to do what you're doing. And some were really excited about it. Uh, but then the information was released when the nephew of a vice president at Ubisoft, who was way too high up in the chain to care about such things, uh, the nephew was working on Raymond Legends. And called up his uncle and said, we're doing this cool thing called rational game design. Mind if I write a Gamma, Sa a Gamma Sutra article? He said, go for it. And the people who had spent 10 years working on this program, on this way of thinking, uh, found out that it was going to be a Gama Sutra article when they read the Gama Sutra article. <laughs> at which point they said, oh, good, we can talk about it now. And Susan Gold, who was at Northeastern at the time, brought the, one of the heads to come talk to us. Uh, I don't know if anybody here was at that. Uh, Chris Foster was there, a few others who were, who were industry professionals and a lot of their students. So that, that was a nine-day talk that they turned into a two-day talk at Northeastern, Saturday and Sunday, uh, which I turned into a one-hour talk that I delivered in my class. And it works. Uh, I was able to rearrange things, and, and I gave it last year here. Uh, I guess it was recorded. I recommend it. Uh, it is a very concrete, useful system for building a difficulty curve. Uh, it's really magical. I, I love it. And they weren't the first person to come up with that idea. Um, that's rational game design. I think it's uh, Naughty Dog that has rational level design. That's a very similar idea, sort of parallel development, but maybe a bit sooner there. So we talk about that, and that's how we build tutorials. Uh, and Forrest Dowling's uh, encounter building talk uh, we use as well to start talking about if you're doing a game where you've got to enter a space and deal with enemies, here's how you do that. Um, that's part of our talks. And we talk about 2D level design. And with all of that, they're then off to the races with building out your levels. We're also, uh, I have a talk on audio design during that time. We're talking about Photoshop and 2D art. Um, oh, and two weeks of marketing, uh, where they're making trailers and websites 
and uh, press releases and uh, getting ready for the final presentations, which is a big party. Uh, we have, as I said, about 30 to 40 students. We get about 100, 150 people. They're playing their games. Anybody who's taken the class in the past and has continued working on their game is welcome to come back and show their game, uh, and it's great fun. You are all welcome to join us. I always announce it on the Boston Indies list. Uh, so naturally, I stand on the shoulders of giants with this course. Uh, the game testing methodology and worksheets come from MIT's Gambit Game Lab via Firehose Games, along with the Week 7 system for choosing the final teams, as I mentioned. Uh, the first lesson in playful mechanics with a bag of random toys and dice and weird boards that we use in the very first week uh, comes from Paul Skydema's uh, 2003 game design workshop at Game Developers Conference. Uh, and I owe Jenna Hofstein, uh, who's a wonderful designer here in the Boston area, for our theory of game marketing and a talk that she gave at Boston Indies some years ago. Uh, my second course, I mentioned that Forrest Dowling provided the encounter building, um, and I can't pronounce his last name, but at Ubisoft, it's Alexis Jolis Desutilis, and Susan Gold for uh, rational game design. Uh, we use Jesse Schell's Art of Game Design for the first few weeks, which offers an opportunity to recontextualize what they're thinking when they submit their game design doc on Piazza, our forum, and in person. There's always required to be a paragraph at the end where they're talking about the reading. Uh, and we look at uh, Reality is Broken by Jane McGonigal, who not only provides our alternative, uh, alternate game design theory that we use for that class, but also provides what I treat as our favorite uh, definition of a game, which is, anybody know? Yes? Voluntarily overcoming unnecessary obstacles. Yes. Uh, her, her language is voluntary engagement with unnecessary obstacles, which allows for the possibility of not overcoming them. But yes, essentially, absolutely. Uh, I love that. Uh, we, we get a chance to talk about golf. Uh, what is the purpose of golf? Play the least amount of golf. Uh, so that's true. <laughs> absolutely. But in a purely practical sense, what are you trying to accomplish with golf? Ball in the hole. What is the most straightforward way to accomplish that? You take the ball, you take a hike, you go over to the ball, and I, I wouldn't even drop it, that's, that's lots of chances of missing. You just put it in, yes? The unnecessary obstacles make it to the game. And you can do that with every sport. It's, it's really a fun discussion, because when you realize that bowling could actually be even more fun if you could walk down the aisle and kick down the pins. <laughs> It's a good discussion. Um, and we also uh, use her definition of fun. She talks about a number of concepts, but we tend to focus on uh, flow and fiero, where flow is that sense of productivity, the feeling that you have agency, that every time it is your turn to do, you are able to do and progress your interests. Uh, for this reason, I hate mechanics that cause you to lose a turn. And I tell my students, you can do whatever you want, but I will turn my nose at you if you include anything that does that. Fiero is that moment uh, in the American uh, women's soccer where uh, in one of the first big games everybody knew about, uh, one of the uh, athletes threw herself on the ground, ripped off her shirt, and screamed. It's a great example of Fiero. It's that big excitement, it's accomplishment, it's achievement. And it isn't only the big, yes, I won it. Sorry, that was a bit loud. Yes, I won at the very, very end. Uh, it is also the incremental achievements along the way that keep you engaged, that keep you feeling like, I am successful at this, I can master this. Uh, so part of how we avoid the feelings of doom and failure that Ian worried about for this course is we redefine what success means in this course. Oh, yeah, there's a... Flow and fear. Uh, we have a rubric for all the projects that uses these five measures, uh, each with written feedback uh, and with a numbered score of one to five, where five is excellent, three is mediocre, one is absent. Uh, and before I go through these, I want to jump to the end to mention that this is, a, we tell the students, this is not a scale in which they are graded for any project until the final one. 
The final project, sure, this contributes to their score. But for every project that they do, they are being graded at least as much on their engagement with each other, their work with their teams, and their experimentation, their willingness to take risks to try strange new things. And that ultimately, a catastrophically, amazingly failed gameplay experience for their final project that shows that they took exceptional risks and were trying neat, original things will be scored at least as well as a game that works game-wise. Not works in terms of the technology, but works as a fun experience. So they're given room to play. They're not told it has to just function. They get to decide for themselves, to a large degree, what is success. We give them some guidance by giving them these five measures. But they could decide to do nothing with immersion because they're really just interested in the innovation, really interested in Flo and Fiero. They'll get a low score for immersion, but they'll stay fun. It doesn't impact the grade. They acknowledge that we didn't focus on this thing. It's OK. So clarity. When it's a tabletop game, are the instructions, the mechanics, and the visuals uh, concise and easy to understand? In digital games, we're asking if the player abilities and goals are progressively on route. You don't need to tell us everything the player can do in the very first screen. Just as with a novel, we don't need to know everything about this character's life in the first few sentences. Let us grow in our understanding of what's going on. Uh, but we want the player to be able to understand at all times what they are able to do. Even if they're not sure what they're supposed to do, they have a sense of what they could do. Uh, innovation. What new and exciting and challenging gameplay mechanics are included to stimulate interest? Disruption encourages them to focus on that. Radical revision encourages that. There's a lot of times when we're building our intention that that should be a big focus. Immersion. Is the story compelling? The setting, the action framing, the art, the music. And we talk on the very first day about how, and this is me as an artist and an animator saying this, Art doesn't make the game fun. Music doesn't make the game fun. Mechanics make the game fun. We as artists and musicians and other people who make it look and sound pretty and wonderful can create a level of engagement. But it's really dangerous to put a lot of that in the beginning of a large project because then that gets in the way of our playtesters. Uh, we have an example of that from Firehose Games. Anybody here familiar with Slambolt Scrappers? Oh, you should play it. It's good. Uh, it, it has its problems. It's uh, very disruptive. Uh, I'll, I'll take a very brief tangent on this. Uh, it was a tower defense game that was also a fighting game uh, that was um, also a building game. All these sort of mashed together. And the fact that it was a tower defense game, it looked like no tower defense game you've ever seen. And it was Tetris, except that you're building squares of the same color to create weapons and it's awesome. It's on Steam and cheap, and you should play it. Uh, but we spent something like a year of Eitan Gleinert's money and time uh, going in the wrong direction with that project, and especially the last three months of that first year, trying to make it look good, thinking that that would fix things, because we didn't know what a really excited player looked like. And then he came back from winter break, because Eitan always thinks in terms of college and gives his whole team a month off in the winter, comes back from winter break and says, I had this dream, I had this idea that became the core of the final game, and we just scrapped everything and did that. It was radical revision. But it also taught me to never, ever try to make a game better by making it pretty. You got to gray box it first. Uh, flow, as we said, is does the player feel consistently productive? Are they able to act and have those actions matter every turn? That sense of agency, that they're able to advance their agenda. And the Fiero, are there big um, victory moments for players? A sense of achievement, especially against the odds. You don't want a situation where one person is clearly so far ahead, nobody's going to catch up with them, and then they win. Yay. <laughs> you want to feel like at the end it was a close call. Uh, that everybody came back, oh, it just only happened. So uh, all the games in the first half of the semester are pass-fail. If you do it, if you contribute it, uh, you're doing great. Just make the game as interesting and fun as they can. Uh, with all the team's participation, you get full credit. And this helps to take the pressure off. Uh, they don't need to succeed in a specific way. 
and helps them to have fun with each other, which is a really big part of this class. Uh, I've been teaching now for 24 years. I only figured out about five years ago that one of my main goals as a teacher is to get my students to make friends with each other. And that, that will make everything else work. It took me that long to figure it out. It was already happening in many classes. And I was already doing teamwork and peer work, but it never occurred to me that one of the goals should be that because that will bring out the best in the students. And so that's part of the intention here. Uh, with the pressure off, uh, in the sense of what the goal is, I can still ask them to do a lot, as you've seen. I can uh, have them meet with their teams outside of class. I can have them deliver a playable game to play test every single week. I can have them learn a huge amount of content each week in multiple disciplines. And I can have them strive for their own definition of excellence. But the mood every week, despite the fact that it's five courses in one, is light, is happy, is energetic. The students feel they can do it, they can succeed. And part of this is that they know that they have me and a whole team of TAs to help. Uh, but it's also because we hold them accountable as teams and individually. They don't get the chance to go off the rails and disappear because we are with them every week. And these are the five ways that we're doing that. Uh, each week we play their games. They get verbal feedback and type feedback according to the rubric. We ask them to talk and write about their games in the context of the reading. We respond to them on our class forum. Uh, and number two, we remind them that they are each responsible for an equal share of production duties every week, and we teach them how to determine that balance with their teams through trial and error. Uh, we have a very short exercise. Let's say you're on a team of five people, and you think about what you agreed to take on that week. This is now a week later. And you think about how much you accomplished. And we put the rubric for this on the board, uh, but if you uh, did everything that you were asked to do on a scale of one to five, then you got a four. If you did everything you were asked to do and you helped somebody else, you got a five. If you missed some stuff, you got a three. There's no judgment here. We're just trying to figure out what's a reasonable amount to ask you to do each week. If you really feel you got very little done, you got a two. If you actually screwed the pooch and your own life reasons meant that you got nothing done, that's somewhere around a one. Uh, everybody scores themselves, they talk to their teammates, and they average it. And then we go around the room and ask the teams, what is your average score? And here's a team that's somewhere around 3 or 3.5, here's a team that's somewhere around 4, and they get a sense that it's not just individually somebody messing up, the team can be working together to support each other and try to figure out how to balance this better. Which in part may be to realize, okay, they were asking too much of themselves that week, let's balance this out. After a few weeks of this, by the end of the prototyping phase, they've gotten pretty good at understanding what they can reasonably take on in the week, which is certainly not something I got out of college. Uh, and I'm thrilled at how well that works. Uh, and one of the key ideas there is they are expected, especially the artists and the audio people who really want to hold on to their precious art and audio and not give it for a few weeks until it's perfect, they are reminded again and again, gray box it, scratch audio, zero draft it, crack draft it. Every week, you have to have something in the build. <coughs> not only because the game needs your stuff to be able to function and for us to be able to test and see proportions and hear sounds, be able to understand if the game is functioning, uh, but also, your team needs to know that you're contributing every week and not waiting. You can't be precious about your stuff. Uh, in the second half of the term of the digital games, each student submits a personal project report every single week. It's a very short, typed paragraph. It may include screenshots. Uh, usually, uh, it includes five topics. What they were asked to do, what they completed, uh, who they helped, who uh, helped them, and any links to tutorials that they found. It's a quick summary of their week. Uh, and this is one of the ways that we're able to grade them individually despite the fact that there's a whole team. And another major, major way that we grade them individually is we do peer evaluation. Uh, this comes from Boston University's Executive MBA program. If you're not familiar, Executive MBA programs are MBA programs where the people aren't there most of the time. They show up like once a week or once a month or uh, even once a year. And sometimes they do this stuff online. Uh, and here they do massive team productions. This is a program that has them creating businesses to take care 
of new water systems in other countries. They're making real businesses, the teams have to function, and their main tool for doing it is this peer evaluation system, where they are evaluating each other on productivity and morale, your contributions and your communication, and then you get a pool of points. If there's four people in the team, including yourself, then there's three not including you, you have 30 points. You have to divide them among the teammates and it can't be even. So you have to make a judgment call. And that makes them think about, okay, so what are they doing that I think is great? What could they be doing that would uh, help us all move better? And those are kept anonymous. We hold on to them, we don't share them, but we offer the students some lessons in iMessages. We play a couple of rounds of witch hunt to talk about how there can be some negative, it's like a uh, werewolf, yes, mafia. Are you all aware that the person who designed Mafia in the early 1980s lives here in Boston? Not true. Dima Davidoff. He lives here? Yeah, he's in Newton. I gotta meet him. He's amazing. I was on a think tank with him for South Newton High to help them design a game design curriculum. And he designed each of the lessons. His brain is amazing. Um, after the bombing uh, of the marathon, uh, and he, one of his sons went to school with the younger of those brothers. Uh, he was researching uh, Islamic culture and, and language, and uh, we did the think tank that year using the framework of Islamic language. So Sirk uh, in Arabic, uh, is a, and specifically in Islam, is a concept of a thing that is forbidden, that is outside of the scope of what we care about, and therefore it doesn't exist. It was a great way to say that's off topic. Um, Amazing mind, yeah, I'm happy to introduce Thank you. Lovely guy. Uh, yes, so we play that to talk about uh, infighting and poor dynamics, uh, and then they are encouraged to take what they wrote in these documents and talk to each other. And sometimes they don't, and sometimes they do, and sometimes they actually have us moderate. Um, but usually the teams are functioning uh, well enough that they can talk to each other when they're unhappy about something or concerned about something, and then able to make it better for the rest of the semester. In the past, I've only done this twice. Uh, I've done it at halfway point on the final project and the very, very end. For the first time this semester, we're also doing it after that one week of get as much as you possibly can for the workplace game in the digital game. Because it occurs to me that it would be nice to get some feedback on how people are doing by midterms so we can look out for issues in the second half of the semester. Finally, I require the students to go to an off-campus networking event, like this. Oops. And uh, some of you may know that I maintain a website uh, at madroom.com that lists every monthly, weekly, and annual event of game development here in the Boston area. Ooh, I got no internet. Can I have internet? I had internet at the Global Game Jam last week. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. So if you go to madroom.com, there's a blue button, and the blue button links to every event in the area. This is the most socially connected game development community in the entire world. Nobody else has a dozen things you can do in game development with people outside of your home every single month. It's really an amazing, amazing place here. You should go. Yes. Thank you, MIT. I appreciate your thick pipes. So here's the button, and here's the stuff. Monthly events, weekly events, annual events. Oh, look, it's the Boston Fig. <laughs> I'm also going to go to the course website, which is another part of the way that this course is able to succeed. I'm just going to madroom.com slash tufts. It never really occurred to me to make a website for a class until I went to Tufts and found out that everybody in the computer science department did so. Uh, I never need to email myself any materials. I never need to bring a thumb drive. Everything for my entire course is on this website. Uh, the PowerPoints, every file I want them to download, everything we're going to use in Unity. Anything purple, by the way, is Unity. Uh, every single piece of material. Each week has its own resources. Here in the, uh, you can look at a single week, this is the very first week. 
which includes digital copies of the boards so that if they want to modify them over the course of that week, they can. Uh, they have the lecture notes, the class files, examples from past students, additional articles, notes from Unity, homework reminders, and I started doing something brand new this year. I started adding video lectures by prominent game designers. I feel dumb in uh, t over t uh, let's see, 20 years now of digital arts education. It never before occurred to me that I should be introducing my students to professionals in their fields via lecture. Certainly, I'm having them go to networking events, but they should know who Brenda Romero is, yes? They should know who Robin Hanecki is. There are a lot of really amazing, Rob DeVoe, they should know these names. They should know the people on whose shoulders they intend to stand. And so every single week, I actually contacted Brenda and uh, Ian to get suggestions for this list, which is a lot of fun uh, because Brenda had a major deliverable due in 48 hours uh, in Ireland. So it was the middle of the night when I was contacting her and she just wouldn't stop offering suggestions. She said, I've got to go now, but wait, here's another one. Uh, so here we have, uh, in the very first week, uh, Brenda Romero and then Greg Kostikian. Occasionally extra credits, like Fail Faster talk, are so good. Uh, here's Matt Leacock and Rob DeVoe on the Making a Pandemic Legacy, the GDC talk from a couple years ago that was so good. Uh, playing games as a designer from extra credits. Uh, John Romero, I disagree with almost everything he says here. The early days of did software. Uh, he doesn't prototype. Like, he doesn't paper prototype. Uh, he's John Romero, he doesn't have to. Uh, but you should. Uh, Robin Huneki and uh, looking at uh, Keita Takahashi, who's the Katamari Damacy guy, uh, and a Nabi Nabi boy. Uh, Kim Swift, uh, specifically her talk about going from Nabrecular Drop to Portal, which is about students making good. Um, looking at Warren Spector and Doug Church uh, and some of their talks. So it, it goes on. Uh, Will Wright's talk is also particularly fun. Again, you're welcome to peruse and steal. Uh, but this, is, this has also been something nice. I, I would guess maybe only a third of my students actually take the time to look through these. But then they are talking about them and excited about them and imagining themselves uh, being there at some point. Ooh, OK, now I've run out of time. Uh, I got seven minutes. Of course, what ultimately matters is not how much we get to cover, but what the students produce. So I wanted to show you some trailers to give you an idea of what uh, the students do. Uh, this is Red versus Blue, which is a fairly unique platformer about dealing with bullying. Uh, you have the ability to control red and blue lights to make platforms appear, and you can pants the bullies by turning off their pants, which have to be red or blue, and then they go throw plates at you. Uh, most students in this course have only a CS background, so all this art is pixel art. Uh, this was made by two students who learned pixel art that semester because they were just excited to try it. They used a pixel edit in case you're interested. I'd like to show you a very affectionate boa constrictor. This is a game from just this past fall that was pitched as a game to teach consent. You are a boa constrictor. Uh, you play the snake. Your energy depletes with every single move. Uh, you consult with animals and people to find out what needs to be delivered to what to pass the level. You can ask for hugs to replenish your energy. If they say yes, you play a mini game to attempt to hug them. And if they say no, you try to hug them and, and if you try to hug them anyway, there are consequences. Uh, and in a course where one of the few topics that I said before that is not covered as game narrative, I was really impressed by how much they accomplished uh, in terms of world building with just a few lovely interactions. This is special. I'm going to jump forward in this because there's a whole backstory that we're in a rush. 
Uh, it's a puzzle game that can only be played by exactly three players. Uh, the previous talk today was an intimacy talk. I loved it. And this is, I think, one of the more intimate games that I've seen my students create. Uh, you have to very closely negotiate with them to move the box. That was what you're seeing there is a more easy level, but they get progressively more challenging. They actually built 10 levels in the last few weeks. And by the end, they were hard enough that they couldn't be finished uh, in a casual playtesting scenario. You had to be really spending time focusing and thinking. Design, delegate, and destruct is a tower defense game where you are inside the tower defense game. It's a first person tower defense. So the enemy is this horde coming over the hills at you and you are frantic, they're all red, you're frantically putting blue people down to go fight them and cannons if you've got enough points. Uh, and it's actually remarkably intense. This is an example of a team that didn't put, get their act together until about uh, a week and a half before the end. They were working hard, they were trying to make it happen, but they were really focused on getting the systems functioning. I spent all time in the systemic design talk before the, uh, the intimacy talk, and this is very much that, lots of different systems that are interacting with each other. And usually we talk about agile, we talk about user stories, when we're doing prototyping, get the thing that's going to be in front of the player right away. They didn't, but they still managed to pull it off by the end. Um, I'm going to jump to this one last game because we're really out of time. I want to talk about Displaced. Uh, this is one of my all-time favorite games that my students have created, and I love it most because I was dead certain it would not work. The basic pitch was for a game where the player would get worse at playing it the more they played it. <laughs> and this sounded terrible to me. Uh, games are about learning and growing and mastery. Why would anyone want to play a game that made them feel like they sucked harder? Uh, I shared my misgivings. I always let them know you can do whatever you want, and they stuck to their guns and made an amazing game about self-doubt and isolation. Uh, you are playing a blob in the Blob Death Olympics. Uh, it's a platformer, and the platforms are strewn with junk. When you touch the junk, you consume it, you grow in size and weight, and you move slower and jump less high to avoid the many red monsters and death traps, which are constantly killing you. The levels are amazingly well designed, uh, that you can explore them and finish them with a variety of strategies, all which need to be carefully considered. And the storyline of abuse and self-hatred that in the end leads to self-love, the redemptive story uh, thematically fits the strange, engrossing mechanics really well. And it turned out to be tremendously fun and engaging to play. It reminds me of a game that came out just that fall, a few months later, uh, Undertale, which most of us here in the Boston community agree that if that designer had actually come out of his basement, I guess his friend's basement, and hung out with us at networking events and talked about his game, we would have discouraged the game. That doesn't make any sense. Why would anybody want to play that? And of course, it was amazing. And it called hits. Uh, so I've taught this now, as I said, 10 times in 10 semesters. At Tufts, it is now Crossless with the Film and Media Department and ILBS. So we're getting even more diverse people. The first time I taught this course at Tufts, on the final day of presentations, was the first time since my bar mitzvah that dozens of people lined up to shake my hand. They loved it. It's reflected in the course evaluations, many saying it was one of their best experiences in college. They loved the teamwork, the chance to push themselves in new directions. The course offers them massive amounts of flow and fiero by including everything that makes game development such an amazing experience. We included all of that in this course. The crazy course works because the TAs are there to support it uh, with labs three times a week, because the course website offers meaningful resources and support, because each lesson meaningfully builds on the previous, and because we put them in playful frames of mind through play-oriented lessons and meaningful feedback. But mostly it works because the students are engaging with such vigor. Many stay after class to play games like Ninja and Happy Salmon, or to take additional Maya lessons so they can learn to actually do character modeling. They're hungry for every bit of it, and it's such a joy to serve as a teacher of this crazy pants circus of a course. 
and I don't really have time to take questions. Oh, is it lunchtime? <gasps> well, I'm not going to keep you from lunch, but if you want to ask questions, I'll stay. Thank you for listening. I would like questions, but also like feedback because. Are you glad you stayed? Yes. So that was a great talk, but not quite what I was expecting from the title. Oh, also from the title? Yeah. Okay, because the description is actually wrong. The description is the person I replaced, but the title was mine. What were you expecting from the title? I actually thought this was going to be a crazy design course. Yeah. Ah. So the corresponding crazy design course was also very interesting. Yeah. yeah. I would say the construction of what it was more to or how I taught. Yeah. Nice. Okay. So I did uh, share a lot of the ways that we teach things. Yeah. And it would be fun to try to do all of those in an hour. <laughs> Maybe I'll try to do that next time. I mean, I got some cool stuff out of it anyway. Also, I've seen your website before, but I didn't know how to find most of the really interesting stuff on there, so thanks for that. Sure. Well, the education stuff is hidden in that you need to know to go to Tufts, you need to go to go to Harvard. Definitely you can see also my Harvard classes. If you go to uh, memory.com slash Harvard, you can see all six of the Harvard, uh, seven of the Harvard classes. That's good By the way, that was a really good thread. The really Facebook good. thread on uh, what games to get. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I followed that right quick. So, Jason, I have a question. Yeah. First, I want to introduce myself. My name is Josh. Hi. I'm a PhD uh, student at Northeastern. And actually, oh, nice. I had the pleasure of being taught by Mike Shaw uh, in his uh, HCI course. So, very, very wonderful person. But um, you described teaching flow, and I'm very confused because I've never heard flow described the way you describe it. Um, I've read a lot of Mihai Csikszent Mihai's original flow theory, and what he talks about and when he originally defines flow is.